Hi, my name is Katina Michael, and I'm your instructor for Public Interest Technology 502, co-designing the future. I'm with Chris Richardson this morning, and uh, Chris, I might get you to start by introducing yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, like you mentioned, my name is Chris Richardson. Uh, just over five years here at Arizona State University. I am a uh, deputy CIO uh, responsible for product ownership and uh, leadership development. I led um, our, our uh, development organization for quite some time, building tools and solutions that serve you all as students, uh, plus our staff and faculty. So things that you see like our Asian mobile app, um, tools that move you through and integrate with things like Canvas and, um, and ways to serve you. So that's kind of my, my, my day job. Uh, before ASU, I was with Honeywell for 12 years in a bunch of different capacities. And also have a very big interest in uh, the smart city movement. Uh, I was sh sharing with Katina uh, before we put record that uh, I'm launching a podcast in um, January uh, that will be called the Urban Complex. Uh, tech through and through, um, and a tinge of leadership there, obviously on the product side uh, and the people side. Um, Chris, I know responsible innovation has piqued your attention recently. How do you understand what responsible innovation is? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm new to it, uh, as, you, as you mentioned. Um, uh, the, C, the chief information officer at ASU, Lev Gonick, uh kind of picked up on some cues, and we had a person that's in the school, uh, SFIS, uh, that is actually uh, pursuing some studies there. And this responsible innovation theme came forward, and we've turned that into a goal for um, our university technology office. So what is the goal, basically? Well, first, it's just to define what responsible innovation means to a, an IT organization. And as we've inter interfaced with people like you and others that are in the school, uh, we've learned that there's not a ton of actual responsible innovation frameworks being applied to IT organizations. So it's a really um, unique opportunity. And I think it boils down to twofold. Um, we all know that ASU has been number one in innovation you know, six years in a row. Well, so what is the IT organization contributing to innovation? Well, um, part of our goal for responsible innovation is having that pipeline of innovation activity. So new products, new services, new projects, um, and, and really that mindset. And then the responsible side of that is, is having the lens by which you operate that grounds the team in a way that thinks big. Who are you including? Who are you not including? How do you get the... Um, the right mechanisms in place so that you can go back um, and, 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 and grant, reground if you start pursuing into one of these gray areas, as we've seen with some of these quote unquote amazing companies out there, the data that can be collected can be done in such nefarious ways. I mean, I hate to say this, I know it's public, but like, even with our ASU mobile app, we know a lot about what's going on, but we've designed it from the beginning where privacy is by design and that it's it's, it's only using what's meant to be used. It's very clear what we're using it for. And we don't cross those steps. We wanna build trust. And so I think that's it. It's, for, for us, responsible innovation is a mindset of being innovative, but grounding in principles that um, are, are very clear and, uh, and that, that keep us um, focused through the, the, the life cycle of a product service or project. It's great to hear you talk about privacy by design. I know the great Anne Kavukian personally, uh, a mentor of mine, and we've seen now PBD sort of translated into like 50 plus languages uh, around the world. It's embedded into the GDPR. It's so important. We've also got other types of by design. We've got value sensitive design that we're talking about in this class. We've got engineering by design, ethical alignment by design, democracy by design. There are all these by design, social justice by design, the list grows and grows. Um, this is very interesting to me because it pertains to the public interest. And we're a university at ASU. Uh, you're responsible for the technology within this university. You mentioned the mobile app and of course, a whole host of other innovations uh, related to the smart cities regional projects we're engaged in. How do you understand public interest, Chris? What's public interest technology? If I was to you know, hit you with this new emerging term, public interest technology, what does that mean to you? Well, uh, I haven't put a ton of thought before the question. So 
what, what, what it sounds like to me is that um, the, the public at large is our citizens, citizenry. And so uh, what I like to do is put myself in the mind of who I'm trying to serve. So with our ASU mobile app, you know, we, we didn't just be this lofty administration where we just thought we knew what the student wanted and then build that. Well, we started with students being asked what would serve them. We, we, we did a lot of customer um, surveys and we still maintain that. I mean, we, we deliver new features at least every other week. Um, we've, we've, we've operated in a unique way with COVID and with the daily health check. And, and we get a lot of feedback throughout that. In fact, um, for this audience, they might've seen the rolling three month calendar. Uh, we knew early on that there was some unpopular features when the first health check first launched. And so it's been that response, responsive um, nature of having the customer at the center. And so back to your question, the public side is the citizenry. The interest is what's important to them and how do you be inclusive of who you consider the, the citizen or the public um, is probably what, what comes to mind. I know that um, in, in technology, in my circles, uh, I'm a big fan of Amazon and Amazon Web Services. In, in that uh, they're this amazing cloud provider. We've done a lot. We've moved almost our entire workloads to the Amazon Web Services cloud. And what's really unique back to this public interest is that they put the customer at the center of their decisions. And we've seen that literally done. And we're trying to be a responsive university technology office. Similarly, whether we're building something for staff or faculty or students, we try to start with who, who the customer is. And then second, we really focus on what the problem is and now with this responsible innovation framework, we have this grounding lens to, to, to keep us so that we don't disengage from that customer along the way in a way that might jeopardize that trust and or the, 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 the things we've said we were going to do. So, um, so to me, that's what public interest kind of invokes. Um, but uh, like I said, I hadn't really thought about it before. Well, am, I, am I on the right track? I tell you what, you're on. You're right on that track. Um, in fact, I love all the discussion about stakeholders and stakeholder engagement, and stakeholder analysis, and ensuring we know who's who, who are we serving, who do we work with, and just there. You know, I mean, there are the employees at ASU, there are the students, there are the general public, there is the provider, Amazon Web Services, and what we see at this is this this connection, this bringing together through the responsible innovation framework that's the hope um, to yeah. link back to the asu charter so there's this linkage there which is oh, yeah. being wrapped around yeah serving serving the broader community it's a really interesting piece of our charter and with um, you know issue things big i mean our we're not just talking our local tempe community we're talking global scale yeah. um one one thing that uh again back to the amazon web services side of things uh, you, you, you may be aware of our ASU Smart City Cloud Innovation Center. It's actually a strategic partnership we signed with Amazon Web Services, and they provided resources, and we engage all the municipalities of this, the, the Maricopa County. So the 22 cities and towns, I think we've already had about, um, I think 14 of them went through the, the KIC Cloud Innovation Center in 2020. We've done 30 challenges with, with public interest bodies. They bring, it's not just IT people, they bring in a broad spectrum of, of people, of employees there. Sometimes they bring in a citizen or, or they get the perspective of that interest. Um, and, and, and we use the AWS working backwards process to hone in on the problem. And then we, um, we, 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 we use their tools to, they write a press release to think from the lens of the customer. Like if this were implemented a year from now, what would the press release be? So they start with that then we create these frequently asked questions by, by asking these questions and providing the answers. It helps bring it to what's important. And then we prototype. And it's been really fun to see uh, the municipalities kind of think differently uh, in this way. And now, again, back to responsible innovation, we, we, we think we can continue to kind of layer in tools to get the best outcomes in this kind of uh, public-private partnership, so to speak. I think I like the idea of... Uh the proprietary processes actually, uh, who are on the cutting edge, you know, these large organizations dealing with so many customers, uh, they've invested a lot of time into their own personal uh, internal frameworks and processes and to hear about the ability to rapidly go from press release back to the prototype, you know, 
is a very different mindset to the traditional systems development life cycle. Sure. Yeah, and it's, it's pushing these organizations to think differently. So I think a lot of times we do, it's, 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 it's deemed hard work because to get the relationship with the, the with, in this case, the public interest that's citizen, you know, usually the loudest people are the ones that are really tough to engage with, but yet the people that don't um, engage in the town halls and whatnot, you need to serve them, right? They're, they're often the ones that need the help the most. Um, and so you can find more information on this program at smartchallenges.asu.edu. Uh, we publish all of the prototypes that are completed because you know, Amazon's view is if more people see what worked, they might try the same thing. And of course, selfishly for them, it's all going to be built in the cloud most likely, which helps them. But that, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the way it's working. We're getting that different lens, different point of view, uh, and, and deeply um, understanding the customer and the problem. And when you can do those things, and then with the responsible innovation framework, like you can do amazing things that then don't have unanticipated consequences or, or, or you significantly reduce the risk, that is. So my final question, Chris, looks at the notion of co-design and, you know, there are a lot of design approaches out there. I, I love what I heard a moment ago where you talked about engagement with the end user and people have talked about user-centered design. They've talked about human-centered design. Recently, I was on a call uh, with an executive from the Zamin Institute uh, who was talking about the old way was going from this um, sort of smart cities mentality of the future. And then um, we talked about people centered and then we talked about functionality. And finally, he said, we're talking about well-being. And this co-design process is really a movement away from saying we are doing something for the user to doing something with the user. It's user-led development. It's not just participatory design or participatory frameworks. It's that the user becomes an integral member of the development team and a very different way of thinking. I mean, a moment ago, you mentioned sometimes uh, Amazon might bring in a customer and that customer will bring in a citizen. Or you said, you know, we have these surveys that we launch and we're going through new feature sets on our plan of records, uh, you know, every fortnight or every three or four weeks, uh, there are feature changes, if not every week. So tell me about, firstly, how important has it been to your organization to engage directly with users to co-design with them along the way? And the second thing, perhaps the second part of this question is, where might this go? You talked about town halls, surveys. What are the other methods do you think that we're gonna use in the future to elicit people coming along the design process, not just being spoken to perhaps occasionally? Um, and I know there's a yeah. lot to unpack there. So the first no, really, question is really co-design. So kinda... Keep, keep, keep me, keep me reined in because it's, it's a really interesting topic. So, you know, you heard my title, it's product ownership, um, you know, and, and way back in the day, I helped um, a, a, a customer relationship management company hone in. On, they had three higher education clients and I went out and, and interviewed key decision makers at those three universities and came back and said, look, I, I see these trends. If we, if we can build a product with these seven key features, I think we have a higher education specific solution. And that product way back in the day called Tolisma actually became the industry standard uh, of, of that era until Salesforce really kind of changed things with, with the SaaS platform. And so I've been doing this a, a long time and it really comes down to just asking good questions and, um, and really teasing apart um, what's real versus what's necessary versus kind of nice to haves. And because, you know, I think there's a big trade-off in product um, where you just can't do everything. And oftentimes the loudest, the, the squeaky wheel gets the, gets the grease, so to speak. And that's not always the right thing. And so you've got me thinking though, with this user um, inspired solutions, the tools are there where the user really can be part of it. Meaning, you know, um, Slack and 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 Zoom and these things are designed to engage and they're designed to bring forth information and um, and then with like Atlassian on the back end with with all of our ways to document code and make it more open source and things. Um, 
we, we probably at HU practice the hybrid model where it's more of the user inspired, but not user built with us, except we do hire a lot of student workers. We've had great success. So we, we do have that, although they're of course, technical mindset. So we built, you know, I think we have over 1800 people that have said they would give us feedback from time to time. So we survey, so Qualtrics and, and whatnot are great tools. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting concept. And so maybe there's, you know what, actually we do. So the, the council of presidents, um, all the different uh, student leaders, they actually meet with our team regularly on what they're hearing from their constituency at the different uh, schools and locations and they help guide um, and, and build. Now they're not literally part of the team, but we, they're, they're out there kind of generating feedback for us around the HU Mobile app. They've been doing that for a couple of years. Each year they put together uh, um, a report that goes to the head of the, the EOS organization and Dr. Crow directly, uh, Dr. Run and Dr. Crow. And then, and it's really neat to see that they think of the app as theirs. So we've, we're doing something right. Um, so that's, that's, those are some things that when I think of that come to mind, but it just got me thinking like, how can we do even more? When I, when I joined a little over five years ago, we, in the UTO, we only had one and a half uh, user experience expertise and that's just wasn't enough. And so I've helped um, convey how much more we can get done if we really start to specialize with, you know, the research side of it and the design side of it, and then some of the accessibility elements and, and now with responsibility, responsible innovation, I think it opens up new avenues, but we now have 10 employees dedicated to um, helping inspire a UI UX mindset to bring forth whoever the customer is and, and, and have that in there. So those are some things when I hear the question, I don't know if I missed any of the parts because it was pretty, 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 uh, pretty diverse there. The double barrel question, that one, yes. <laughs> uh, I'll break it down for our future interviewees, but it, it was so well answered and I appreciate that insight because I think one of the things that we're going to be doing in this class is even though it's only seven and a half weeks, asynchronous mode is sharing the different ways in which user engagement can happen, real user engagement, like the examples you've you've mentioned to us. Um, so these are inspiring um, and perhaps create a, a toolkit of ways with which we can engage the user to receive direct feedback if we're not co-designing in parallel. For example, we are still participatory and use inspired, yeah. um, which is inspiring in its own right. I mean, at least you're asking the user, right? And, you're, and well, you've got this deep engagement with them. Yeah, well, and why I, it's, you know, we probably need to do it even better. Just everything is changing so fast. The tools, the expectations, like some of the best companies, they do have deep relationships with their customers. And, and it's unfortunate in that when something works, that becomes instantly the new expectation. And so yeah. if we rested on our laurels and didn't keep innovating, um, we would quickly be irrelevant. And so um, you know, we probably need to do even more, but, that, but that's kind of um, been, been a great piece and a great, it, it helps to be at a place like ASU where that's kind of in our fabric and, and we can invest in these solutions. Because I think what other schools, they're dependent on the industry solutions and they're a little bit more abstracted from, I think, the reality and like we compare apps and whatnot. Um, I think we have a real opportunity to kind of keep this trajectory and start to expand into that broader definition of community and who we serve. So it's a really exciting time to be in a place that is innovative with these tools and mindset behind it. I um, appreciate instead of the students, your time, Chris Richardson, what an amazing 15 minute interview that was. Uh, we look forward to sending you feedback at the end of the actual course with some ideas that you might have triggered, um, but we appreciate what you're doing at ASU. We appreciate the innovative mindset and the growth mindset. And of course the ASU charter Thanks so much for that. Thanks interview. for having me and looking forward to seeing what these students do. It's, uh, it's always inspiring to see how good um, what's, what's taught puts into practice. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Chris.